Everybody ready? All right. So let's talk about multiple sclerosis and mood. So during this present presentation today, I want to talk about three things. First of all, what are depression and anxiety? So it's normal when you first get diagnosed with MS to have some anxiety about it. And it's normal to feel sad about not being able to do the things that you wanted to do if you can't do them. Um, but we're going to talk about when it's not normal. Are depression and anxiety more common in multiple sclerosis? Spoiler alert, yes. But we'll talk about why we think that is. Um, and what treatments are available? What are some of the medications that are available? Um, psychotherapy, and then also some other non-medication treatments that are kind of up and coming or, or things that people are doing now to treat their um, depression and anxiety. So whenever I think of depression and when other people think about it too, they tend to think about people feeling sad. And that's part of it, but there's also this mnemonic that helps me and other people too remember some of the other symptoms associated with depression. And those include sleep changes, so either increased or decreased sleep, loss of interest in the things you used to enjoy, guilt, feelings of guilt or worthlessness, energy, lack of energy, fatigue, cognitive or concentration, um, so problems with memory and thinking, appetite, either increased or decreased eating, and also psychomotor slowing, so as talking or acting slower than normal, and suicidal thoughts, so SIG E caps, helps me remember the symptoms of depression that I should ask about other than just a depressed mood. And what about anxiety? Like I said, it's normal to feel anxious. People get diagnosed with MS and I say, oh, do you feel anxious or depressed? And they're like, yeah, I'm really scared. I have no idea what's going on. But sometimes it's not normal. And the most common um, anxiety disorder is called generalized anxiety disorder. And the diagnostic criteria include excessive anxiety and worry that occurs more, day, more days than not for six months. And it has to occur about several different activities. So for example, some people are like, I'm really, really anxious about my school performance or my work performance. I'm anxious at home. It's about different things. Um, trouble, find, trouble controlling the worrying. So if you're like, well, I can manage it, that's OK. Um, and then anxiety and worry have to be associated with at least three of the following symptoms. So that includes restlessness or feeling on edge, being easily fatigued, difficulty concentrating. Some people tell me their mind goes blank, irritability, muscle tension, and also sleep disturbances. And, and usually it's trouble falling asleep, <laughs> staying asleep, having lots of racing thoughts when you're trying to sleep, worrying about stuff, not being able to shut it off at night when you're trying to go to sleep. So let's talk a little bit about the pathophysiology of depression. So what's the biology behind or the scientific basis behind um, depression? So in terms of anatomy, we won't go into too much detail. The part of the brain that's involved with mood is called the limbic system. And that includes the amygdala, which is the fear center, the hippocampus, which is involved with memory, and the prefrontal cortex, which is involved with motivation and decision making. And here's a really um, general slide. It's an awesome brain picture. Oh, this doesn't work on there very well. But here's the hippocampus, amygdala, prefrontal cortex, um, and the anterior cingulate cortex, which is another part of the brain that they sometimes study when they're, they're thinking about mood. And what about the chemicals involved in the brain? So neurotransmitters are the chemical signals that neurons use to communicate with one another. And the ones involved with mood include serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine, and those are some of the abbreviations we use when we're talking about them. And that's going to be important because the medications that we use to treat mood affect those neurotransmitters. So what about depression and multiple sclerosis? So when I ask patients how they're doing, they usually tell me they feel fine. But in fact, when I ask them more questions about it, they usually do not feel fine. And they tell me they feel some of these ways, um, which makes me sad. So depression and MS. So the rate of depression and MS studies have found it might be twice as high as of people with other chronic diseases, which is pretty alarming because people with other chronic diseases have a lot of problems too. But we found that the rate of depression is actually about twice as high in people who have MS. Having depression and MS is associated with a lower quality of life, no surprise there. But alarmingly, people with depression are more likely to have a delay in their MS diagnosis. And that's really concerning because I don't want people to be delayed when they get diagnosed. We also know that people with depression and anxiety, they tend to do worse. They have a worse prognosis than people who don't. Part of that's because of compliance, 
taking their medications and, and coming to uh, doctor's visits and, and some of its other stuff too. So the lifetime prevalence of depression in people with MS, meaning the proportion of people um, that have MS that will develop, develop depression over their lifetime is 50 to 60%, so more than half. The annual pre prevalence of depression in people with MS, so the, the number of people that have depression and MS in a year, is estimated to be 20 to 25%, so about a quarter of people. By comparison, um, the proportion of people in the United States that are adults in general who have depression in a given year is only 6.7%, so it's a lot higher in patients who have MS. So why are people with MS more likely to develop depression? Well, there are psychosocial reasons, like not being able to do the things you, you used to do or wanted to do. If somebody told me you have a chronic disease and you can't be a doctor anymore because you have all these problems, I'd be really, really upset about it. Or maybe you wanted to always go to Machu Picchu and you can't go there because you're not able to get around. Losing independence, social isolation is a huge one, stigma and lack of support from other people, and also the financial strain, which I'm sure you guys um, know about. It's really expensive and that's very, very stressful. Um, we also think that there are changes in the brain itself that make people with MS more likely to have depression and anxiety. So I looked at one study where patients with depression and MS were more likely to have lesions and had more lesions in the limbic, uh, the lim limbic system compared to patients who didn't. Another study showed that patients actually had activation of the hippocampus, and they think that there's inflammation going on in the hippocampus, which is part of the limbic system. Another study, and this was no huge surprise, uh, showed that people had higher rates of depression during relapses, and they think that's from increased um, inflammation in the brain. So we think that there are changes in the brain itself that make MS patients more likely to have depression and anxiety. What about treatments for depression and anxiety? So most medications that we use target those neurotransmitters that I talked about, serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. And that's serotonin there, the happy molecule. Here's some examples of antidepressants, but I'm going to go through some of the, the more common ones that we use in a little bit more detail. So the most common uh, medication that's prescribed for depression and anxiety and kind of the first line medications are called SSRIs, or Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitors. And I don't know if you guys remember the, the uh, Zoloft blob, um, but I do, and my husband always would make fun of me and be like, can you be like the happy blob and not like the sad one? And I always thought it was pretty cute. Um, the poor little blob was so nervous and sad. Um, and selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs, are things like Prozac, Zoloft, Celexa, Lexapro, and Paxil. And they, the way they work is actually pretty clever. So they actually block the serotonin channel. So these are two neurons that are communicating with one another. And that top green neuron is releasing serotonin that's binding to receptors on the other cell and activating it. And the SSRI is actually blocking the channel that the serotonin uses to get back up into the cell. So it's creating more serotonin um, to be available to bind to that other cell. So that's how it works. It's pretty clever. And these medications tend to be really well tolerated. And I want to like focus on that because a lot of my patients are like, oh my gosh, I don't want to take another medication. I'm nervous about it. But the fact is most people who take these medications tolerate them really well. And they don't usually have a lot of the side effects listed there. They can cause dizziness, drowsiness, dry mouth, insomnia, GI problems, headaches. Um, but most people do fine. One thing it can cause that I hate um, is sexual dysfunction. So difficulty reaching orgasm, maintaining an erection, reduce sexual desire, and this is a big problem because this is already a problem for a lot of people with MS, and I don't want to give them a medication that might make that worse. That's bad. Um, it also sometimes can make spasticity worse, which is also bad because a lot of patients with MS also have spasticity. So what are some other medications that we use? So we use SNRIs that work in a similar way but actually block the reuptake of both serotonin and norepinephrine. And these medications actually are sometimes used to treat neuropathic pain, even in patients who don't have mood disorders. And they include Effexor, Pristique, and Cymbalta. And I sometimes prescribe those for neuropathic pain, and I also prescribe them for depression. Uh, this is a medication that I use pretty frequently. It works on both norepinephrine and dopamine, and it's called Welbutrin. Sometimes people um, have it prescribed to help them quit smoking and that's called Zyban, and I really like this medication because it's much less likely to cause sexual side effects. It can help patients quit smoking or if they have other habits that they're trying to quit. 
it may improve um, fatigue and it may improve ADHD. And a lot of patients with MS have fatigue and cognitive issues. The problem is it may not improve anxiety. So patients who have a lot of anxiety, I might consider using something else or using Wellbutrin and then adding something else to it like Zoloft. And it lowers the seizure threshold. And this isn't usually an issue. It's just if a patient tells me they've had seizures in the past, I might think about not prescribing that medication for them. Here's some newer antidepressants that I don't have a huge amount of experience with, but are kind of exciting. So we have a medication called Vibrid, which is spelled in a really annoying way, um, but that's okay. And this medication blocks serotonin reuptake and also partially stimulates the serotonin receptor. So it's a serotonin medication, but it also works on the GI tract and it can actually be useful in regulating uh, bowel symptoms in people who have irritable bowel syndrome, which is nice because a lot of my patients have that too. Um, it may also have fewer sexual side effects, which is great. Love those medications. And this is medication Brintelix, and they actually changed the name to Trintelix because Brintelix was similar to Brolinta, which is an antiplatelet medication like aspirin. And if I give somebody aspirin, they're probably not going to be less depressed or less anxious. They might be less likely to have a stroke, so they changed the name. Um, and this medication works on a bunch of different neurotransmitters, but there's some evidence that it might actually improve cognitive problems, which is amazing because a lot of patients with MS have cognitive issues, and I would love to put them on a medication that helps with cognition in addition to helping with mood. So these medications, when you're prescribed a medication, one of these, they can take a month to six weeks to see a full effect. Some patients tell me they feel better right away and I'm really happy. I think it's probably a placebo effect if it's like the second after you take it, but whatever it takes, I'm happy that you feel better. Um, and if you stop them suddenly, some patients can have some withdrawal symptoms. Some people do fine, but some people can have dizziness, headaches, flu-like symptoms, irritability and agitation, nausea and diarrhea. And I've been told that Cymbalta is one that if you stop suddenly, you can have a pretty bad withdrawal syndrome. So I don't like patients to um, stop them without telling me. I like to wean them off slowly. So what about therapy? So there are a lot of different um, types of talk therapy or psychotherapy out there, like cognitive behavioral therapy, which is the one I'm most familiar with, which basically identifies ways of thinking that are bad and leading to depression and anxiety and tries to change people's way of thinking, which is pretty clever. And there's also dialectical behavioral therapy, psychodynamic therapy, and couples therapy or group therapy. And many studies have shown that these therapies are actually really effective at treating depression and anxiety, and we know that a combination of using medications and therapy is far superior to using medications alone. So therapy can be time consuming, and patients are like, ah, I don't have time to go to it, but I always remind them, you're not gonna have side effects, you're not gonna have sexual side effects, if anything, maybe it'll improve your sex life, they'll help, um, so that's nice. Um, and there's some evidence now that even doing online therapy, like online programs, can be pretty effective at treating depression and MS. So how about some other non-medication therapies that are out there? So this is a, a therapy that a couple of patients have asked me about called transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS. And the way that this um, therapy works is they actually use a magnet. So this guy's like hanging out his, at his doctor's office and they put a magnet over part of his head and it delivers pulses of magnetic current um, to stimulate the neurons that we think are involved with depression and anxiety. And it's done repeatedly over a series of time. Like I think you do it five days in a row and then you do that for four to six weeks, um, which is kind of time consuming, but can have like long-term benefits. And it's been shown to be pretty effective at treating depression and, and treatment uh, resistant depression. The nice thing is it's non-invasive. So some things that they're doing for treatment resistive, resistant depression are like deep brain stimulation and things like that. But this isn't, this isn't that, this is nice, it's non-invasive. Um, and it's not like um, electroconvulsive therapy, for example, where you have to be sedated for it. Side effects tend to occur kind of like just around the time when they're doing the treatment and they don't tend to be long lived or permanent. Some people have some scalp discomfort, headaches, muscle twitches, and they've reported a slight increased risk of seizure, but not too bad. Um, and in general, I think it's pretty safe for patients with multiple sclerosis to have this, this therapy. I don't really see any reason why somebody couldn't have it. Uh, unfortunately, it can't be used in patients who have metal in the body. So if like, you have aneurysm clips, coils, or pacemakers, or basically anything you couldn't go into an MRI with, I wouldn't want you to get TMS. But otherwise, I think it's a good, a good treatment for depression, and I don't have any problems with it. Like I said, it's been demonstrated as effective treatment for both depression and treatment-resistive depression. It's probably safe for patients with multiple sclerosis, which is great. 
Um, and it might be a good option for patients with, with depression that's hard to treat or who can't tolerate medications, like if they have a lot of side effects from medication. All right, so why should we treat depression and anxiety in MS patients? Pretty, it's pretty obvious, um, but patients with, with, dep with depression are more likely to have a delay in their diagnosis. Um, they're less likely to be compliant with treatment, and they do worse than patients who um, have untreated depression and anxiety. They actually have a worse prognosis. Suicide rates for patients with MS are high compared to the general population, which is horrible. Whenever I read about studies, they'll have like a list of why people died, and there's always somebody who committed suicide. It makes me really upset, because um, that shouldn't be a reason somebody died and wasn't a part of the study anymore. Um, depression and anxiety can destroy your quality of life, and there are effective treatments available. And that's kind of all I've got. That's my daughter, my husband. She's pretty cute. Um, you guys have any questions for me? In neuropathic I do if a patient has um, neuropathic pain. I'll, then I'll specifically pick Cymbalta or Effexor or one of those medications sometimes. That's kind of nice that does both. She asked me um, if I often use um, medications that treat both neuropathic pain and depression. And the, and the answer is yes, I do. Any other questions? Yeah. And, and if you have those two things and you're epileptic? And you're epileptic, you can still use Cymbalta and things like that. I just wouldn't want to use Welbutrin necessarily. I can't think of another doctor. That's OK. So she's asking me about a medication for depression that caused nightmares. So I'm not sure which one it was, but some of these medications can cause one of the side effects I didn't mention is it can cause um, bad dreams and really vivid dreams. So sometimes I tell patients to take their medications in the morning if, if they can tolerate it to help prevent them from having vivid dreams because that's a side effect too from a lot of the antidepressants. Any other questions? Yeah. How would you not prescribe Wellbutrin? Uh, the only times I really don't want to prescribe Wellbutrin is if somebody has really, really bad anxiety that's not well controlled. Um, sometimes I'd rather pick something else. And sometimes I'm worried it could maybe make their anxiety worse, but there's not a huge amount of evidence for that. And if someone's had a lot of seizures in the past, I don't like to prescribe Wellbutrin because I'm afraid it could make them have a seizure or increase the risk of having a seizure. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. You guys have been great.